15 years ago, the Dixie Chicks famously um, criticized the then president from their home state of Texas, George W. Bush, and after being soundly attacked, released a record that announced they're not ready to make nice. Uh, our next guest is not ready to make nice either. In fact, he has written a book indicating that he thinks it's time to fight dirty. David Ferris is a program director of political science and a professor at Roosevelt University in Chicago. And his latest book is entitled, It's Time to Fight Dirty, How Democrats Can Build a Lasting Majority in American Politics. So first of all, David, thanks for coming on the program. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. I look forward to the chat. <laughs> well, uh, let me know afterwards how it turned out. Um, <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing. Um, obviously, uh, there are a couple things we could talk about. You've got a number of, um, besides that declaration of principle that it's time to fight dirty, we could start by talking about that a little bit. You then have a number of specific uh, recommendations. I'd like to hit on a couple of those. And then one of them in particular because of uh, the Supreme Court announcement, uh, the recent Supreme Court announcement. But let's start with just a simple, why is it fighting dirty has always been considered, uh, at least by liberals, progressives, and what have you, to be the wrong thing to do. We just experienced eight years of a Democratic president who prided himself on civility. And we're, we're, we're getting civility lectures all over the place now in the wake of uh, some of the pushback in their private lives against Trump administration officials. Why is it time for Democrats in particular to fight dirty? Well, I think it's been time for Democrats to fight dirty for a while. But I think that the the, the lesson of the last like about 20 years of American political history um, is that Republicans have taken basically every opportunity they've had to, to push the boundaries of legality um, to press their advantage, to maximize their power wherever it's it's legal and constitutionally permissible. Um, you know, the, the the theft of Merrick Garland's seat on the Supreme Court, I think, is the greatest example of, of how Republicans play that game. But there are many, many others going back, particularly during the Obama administration, um, of Republicans, you know, violating these sort of older norms of American politics where the two parties are supposed to cooperate with each other to produce good policy, um, even when there's divided government or even when you're completely in the minority. Um, and Republicans in the Obama administration simply did not do that. Um, they made a determination that their best way back into power um, was to destroy the Obama administration, was to obstruct it at every opportunity, um, was to use every sort of lever of power that they could find um, in the House and then in the Senate to slow down his agenda and, and, to, and to reverse it ultimately. Um, and so the, the sort of like radicalization moment for me <laughs> was when that all paid off. Um, by producing uh, complete Republican control in Washington in 2016. Um, I think up until that point, I'd, I'd held out hope um, that Republicans would be punished for, for the way that they acted during the Obama administration. And they just weren't, you know, and it kind of proved to me that ordinary voters don't actually really care that much about these sort of procedural games that people play in Washington. Um, and that if Democrats continue to be, for the most part, the party of pragmatism, the party of deal making, the party of bipartisanship, while Republicans are playing this pretty ruthless procedural game um, to drive down the Democratic vote and to seize power wherever they can, um, I think that ends in a very bad place for the left. Um, and so that realization is the genesis for this book, um, which is that it's time for Democrats to sort of use their procedural rights in the same way that, that Republicans are. So if, if it's legal, if it's not constitutionally prohibited, um, we should do it if it enhances the chances of Democrats winning the next election or staying in power. See, I've struggled with this question a lot myself, David, and and, uh, and going back a long ways. I mean, it certainly it re reached a fever pitch <clears throat> during the Obama administration and even preceding it when Mitch McConnell famously said, what was it, a couple days after the election, that their goal, the Senate Republicans' goal, was to make sure the Obama presidency was a failure, as which by the old norms of bipartisanship was, was as un-American a statement as uh, any politician could possibly make to wish the president of the other party uh, become a failure and to work to make ensure that uh, become the fact. But of course, uh, if we want to talk about Republicans fighting dirty, we can also go back to the 2000 election. We can go back to sure. the stopping of the county. We can go back to the Republicans on the Supreme Court issuing their, uh, needless to say, 
highly questionable ruling, uh, making it basically placing George W. Bush in the presidency. And uh, we also, I guess, what, I, what I've felt looking at this is, you know, you have the independent left, which is probably where I best fit. In fact, certainly where I best fit, although I'm a registered Democrat. But then you have the Republican, you know, machinery, which has basically no standards or ethics as that I can see based on the old norms. And then in the middle, you have the sort of leading, you might call establishment Democratic Party culture that it seems to me has clung to how do I put this, of, uh, it, it continues to behave as if the world was the way they wish it were, mm -hmm. rather than the way it really is under uh, today's Republicans. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think the, the reaction to, to yesterday's news um, on the part of many Democrats. And I should explain, because we're pre-recording, that yesterday's news was the uh, retirement of Judge Kennedy from the Supreme Court, right? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw Richard Blumenthal's, uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal's initial statement, which he's uh, since walked back, but he said, you know, there shouldn't be any artificial delay of this nomination by the Senate. Um, and it's sort of, uh, in the way that the Democrats are talking about this, like they're saying there's a McConnell rule, you know, like no SCOTUS picks in an election year, blah, blah, blah. Like that's the new informal rule of American politics. What it, what it really says to me is there's this like desperate yearning on the part of the democratic leadership to bring back into being a world where American politics was governed by agreed upon norms. Um, and so trying to conjure yet another norm that Republicans don't care about uh, and won't respect out of thin air is, uh, it's a fool's game, you know, like it's not gonna work. Uh, I'd much rather see the democratic leadership talking about the basic unfairness in the way that openings on the Supreme Court happen in the first place. I'd rather see them talking about uh, a constitutional amendment to, to eliminate lifetime tenure and I'd, I'd like to see them make some threats about packing the courts if none of that works. <laughs> um, that's, I think, what the base wants to hear right now. Like, they want the party to be fighting. They don't want to say, you know, like, what happens if Republicans win the November elections? Um, then are they going to roll over for all of the, you know, for the next pick on the Supreme Court? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me, um, the strategy. And, and like you said, I think it reflects a desire um, to re return to an older form of politics that I think is just gone. Well, and I have to say it also from a political communications perspective, I'm, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this too, David Ferris, but I think when they do that, when, when a statement like Senator Blumenthal made, or I remember actually it reached its uh, height for me uh, a while back when uh, when uh, Leader Pelosi said, you know, you're supposed to have the budget in with 120, within 120 days of X, and they haven't reached X, and this is, it, the, the president, the, the, the Democrats, to me, come across to voters who are looking for somebody to improve their lives, they come across as that kid in junior high who always said, you're not supposed to have your foot in the aisle, you know, who is the hall monitor, who is, you know. Right. It, it, to right. me, that's not what people are looking for. And, and while the Republicans have been vile in my estimation in terms of their abuse of norms and decency in many different cases, uh, at least they act like they want to get something done. Right, yeah, and they're, they're much more serious about it, too. And, I mean, you know, I'm not somebody that thinks the Democrats are useless, but I think that they, they haven't, I don't think that they've properly sort of internalized the lessons of, of, of the last 10 or 20 years of our politics, let's just put it that way. I think that they remain committed to a, a kind of proceduralism in both houses of Congress um, that their counterparts across the aisle simply don't care about anymore. Um, and the idea that if they just stick to it throughout this this terrible period in our history and then they get back into power and they can restore some of these norms, it just doesn't make any sense to me um, because I don't, I don't think that Republicans will cooperate in that project. As in, well, you know, Mitch McConnell may not be a very nice man, but I'm sure their 2016 presidential nominee will go back to just the kind of decency we're used to. Um, right. well, I yeah. think that's exactly right. And I, I, I think that, and again, we're talking with Professor David Ferris, author of the book, It's Time to Fight Dirty, How Democrats Can Build a last, Lasting Majority in American Politics. And frankly, uh, uh, David, your book is kind of a breath of fresh air to me because I feel like this is a conversation we need to be having is like, look, these guys are horrible. They're... Uh, they're incredibly well-funded. They have no scruples that I can perceive. I mean, you know, individuals may, but you know, as a, as a collective entity. Um, and uh, we need to come out 
swinging. So, uh, and it's also great to me because uh, to have these conversations because I feel as if you know the broad, broadly speaking, the left. You know, everyone from center left to liberal to progressive to socialist to whatever you know want to, however you want to define the spectrum uh, on that side of the dividing line. Um, I feel like that that community as a group has a tendency to despair and fatalism. You know, they just oh now we're now we've, we're really shafted because you know mm -hmm. now they're going to get a majority of the Supreme Court or whatever. And I like it says well okay let's let's mess with the the total number on the Supreme Court and we can talk about we'll talk about that in a minute. But or oh boy you know the Senate you know it's like. Uh, you know, they're always going to have Wyoming or what, what? Okay, let's talk about what we can do about the Senate. So let's talk about uh, some of the ideas in your book because I, I, I think that um, I think this is exactly the conversation we need to be having. So um, I called up the the list here. Of course, it is not helping. Uh, my internet is not helping me out because it's <laughs> it's made them go away. But. Um, Let's start with the first one. You call it the 58 state solution. So let's talk about that for a second. What's the 58 state solution? Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, the basic idea is that um, Democrats have a structural disadvantage in the United States Senate. So, uh, of course, every state, no matter how large or small in terms of population, gets the same two senators. Um, and because there has been a proliferation over the course of the 19th and early 20th century of a very small very rural states, and particularly in the U.S. West, um, it means that there are roughly 30 or 31 Republican-leaning states and 19 or 20 Democratic-leaning states. Um, so that in a normal election year, um, of course, only a third of the Senate goes up for election at any time. But you know, for the sake of argument, in a normal political environment, Democrats are fighting at a major disadvantage in the U.S. Senate. Um, in, a, in a neutral environment, Republicans will probably hold, you know, uh, 58 to 60 seats, and Democrats will hold 40 to 42. Um, and uh, even in a, in a democratic leaning environment, as we see this year, we're going to have trouble taking back the Senate um, because of the structural disadvantage. And you can't change that uh, in the U.S. Constitution. Like we can't amend ourselves out of that because there's a there's a clause there that says that the states can't be deprived of their equal representation um, without their consent. Right. Which they're never going to give. <laughs> right. Like Wyoming is never going to say, like, sure, you know, take away our equal representation. Um, so we, we have to have a workaround. You know, in, 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 the, in the sort of dark hours after the 2016 election, uh, I, you know, I, looked, I was like, well, maybe what about 2018? And I looked at the map for 2018 and it was just dreadful. You know, it was a dreadful map for us. Um, and so it kind of got me to thinking about, like, you know, what, what actually could we do about this? Um, and the, the sort of low hanging fruit here is, uh, is giving statehood to Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico, um, both of whom are full of birthright American citizens who have no voting representation in Congress whatsoever. Um, they both have robust statehood movements. I think there's majority sentiment uh, in Puerto Rico, and I'm, for sure there's majority sentiment for, for statehood in D.C. Um, and these are things that could happen with a simple, a simple act of Congress um, signed by the president. We would have D.C. And, and Puerto Rico as states, and then we'd have four extra seats in the U.S. Senate. Um, I, I like to remind people that if, if, if we had made, if we'd done this 20 years ago, um, First of all, George W. Bush would never become president. Um, second of all, Democrats would hold the Senate right now. Uh, otherwise, they'd have, a, they'd have a narrow majority in the U.S. Senate right now if D.C. and Puerto Rico were states. So to me, there's no argument. I, I just, just For the left, there's no plausible argument against this. It's, it's the right thing to do from a Democratic theoretic perspective. Um, it's also just like a, it's like a killer move uh, in, t in partisan terms because it would really help the Democratic Party uh, kind of keep, keep up uh, with their opponents in, in the Senate. Um, but that's not enough. Um, and that's why I want to go to 58 states instead of 52 um, by breaking up the state of California into, into seven or more pieces, um, <laughs> which is, uh, I guess, one of the zanier ideas in the book. I mean, I think, uh, I think Puerto Rico and D.C., this is, this is stuff that could happen in the first month of the next Democratic administration, whereas California is something that's, that's a project that's, that's going to take time. Um, we'll get a sense of, of how Californians feel about breaking the state up in November because there's actually a, a ballot initiative to divide California into three um, that will be voted on this November. Uh, I suspect it will lose pretty badly. Um, and so that'll give us a sense of how much work we have to do in terms of thinking about how to convince the people of California that this is both in their interest but also in the interest of the Democratic Party. But again, there's nothing constitutionally standing in the way here. Um, to break up an existing state, it, you require an extra step, which is an act of the state legislature. 
Um, and I think in terms of fairness and, and morality, we would want to have one of California's crazy ballot initiatives here to, to get the people of California on board. Like I wouldn't want uh, the California state legislature passing a divide California bill over the opposition of the people of the state. So yeah, it would be tough to do too. Yeah, um, let me yeah. just do a quick station identification. We're talking with Professor David Ferris about his book. It's time to fight dirty uh, recommendations for the uh, Democrats. And um, okay, Professor Ferris, just a, 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 one more thought about the California division. Um, there have been other propositions in California. I always worry about the wealthy Silicon Valley and San Francisco uh, hub being carved out with all of that revenue uh, being taken away from the Central Valley and other places that are, are struggling a lot more economically. That's my biggest objection. I mean, I like the idea of all those liberal senators, but uh, sure. that's my biggest worry about breaking up California. Sure. I mean, I think there's different ways to draw the maps um, so that you, you know, you might attach some more rural, some some less well off areas to that to that area of the state. I think that the the, um, the first proposal to divide the state from a few years ago would have basically made a state out of Silicon Valley itself. Um, and I think that would be a terrible idea for the for the future economic uh, status of the rest of the entities that emerge from this. So, um you know, it's not. I mean, I have a map in the book, <laughs> uh, but it's really it's not up to me to draw this map, right? I think it's right. more it's more the principle of like, um, you know, progressive power in this country is diminished uh, because so much of it is bottled up in the state of California. Um, the people of California don't have the representation in the Senate that they right. that they deserve, and the things that you can achieve at the state level um, under under the sort of current model of federalism in the U.S. are much less significant than what could be achieved nationally um, with better progressive power. Uh, in other words, I think the people of California would be better off um, if if we could have progressive policy made at the national level uh, in addition to at the state level in California. Well, and it's a really interesting idea uh, I, uh, about which I love the aggressive thinking there. I mean, I live in a neighborhood of about <clears throat> probably 80 people, very democratic, very liberal. As far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, I'd make the state of Escal's neighborhood. You know, we have two senators. <laughs> you don't like it? You think it's unfair? You should have thought about that when you were bragging about Wyoming. Um, right, yeah. So, yeah, I like the boldness of it. Uh, you talk about a new uh, Voting Rights Act and a couple procedural things, I guess I would say. Voting Rights Act. To me, this is amazing that Democrats have not been fighting uh, and openly fighting and making a national issue out of the fact that the Republican Party is doing the most un-American thing possible by systematically suppressing the voting rights of minorities and other groups that have been, that tend to vote Democratic, depriving them of their vote, voting rights, not necessarily because they're you know, they're racist SOBs, although they, that could be a factor, but because that's how they win elections. It's amazing to me that the state level cheating has not become a, a major cause celeb for Democrats. Yeah, and I think that's a shame because I think it's a really important issue. I mean, I will say there's a lot of really uh, terrific and inspirational work being done at the state level to, you know, uh, to do things like uh, register people automatically to vote. Um, to you know, to fight against these voter ID laws that have that have the, the transparent effect of driving down minority turnout. But um, you know, the, in the book, I argue that uh, this is something that's amenable to a national policy solution. Um, the the elections clause of the Constitution very clearly um, gives Congress the right to regulate um, the state's conduct of federal elections. Um, and so we could we could do a lot of things overnight. We could um, automatically register every single American to vote so that it's an opt-out system rather than an opt-in. Uh, we could declare a national uh, federal election holiday uh, that I think would increase turnout on the margins. Uh, more importantly, we could eliminate um, voter ID laws and we could also eliminate felony disenfranchisement laws. Um, collectively, all of these things would, would add millions of, of voters to the rolls. Uh, it would increase turnout, uh, I think, by 10% or more. Um, and as we know about what we know about non-voters is that they're uh, overwhelmingly less well-off um, and uh, I think almost certainly lean democratic in the aggregate. So it's, it's, again, it's another place where it's like, it's the right thing to do, right? Where the, you know, one of the few countries in the world that has any of these policies, let, let alone all of them. Um, and uh, we're really an outlier in terms of voting rights. And so um, we could pass a modern voting rights act that would eliminate um, all of this contention. I mean, there's 1.6 million people in Florida alone who are disenfranchised by the felony laws. 
Um, and if you know anything about, you know, how close the elections in Florida often are, sure. uh, it's, it's transformative. I mean, scholars who've, who've looked at this think that there are multiple Senate elections um, that have been flipped by, by felony disenfranchisement and voter ID laws in, just in the last 20 years. Um, there's, there's scholars that think that the state of Wisconsin went for Trump um, because of the voter suppression law that was signed by Governor Walker. So um, this is something that the National Democrats need to get serious about. Um, with all due respect to everyone doing this work at the state level, um, this is something that needs to be done federally. Um, and it, we need a, like a, kind of a one, one-stop shopping solution um, to the kinds of things that are going on. And there's, again, there's nothing constitutionally stopping the Democrats from doing this next time they're in power. It's a simple act of Congress signed by the president. And, and then we, we can really move beyond um, some of these voting wars. Yeah, and you also, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and again, astounds me that this has not been seized upon already. And your, your approach is great and clear. And you also talk about uh, obliterating winner-take-all elections, which to me also focuses democratic energy where it needs to be, which is on a, instead of, you know, um, what's the word, uh, fixating their rage post-2016 on, on a few Jill Stein voters around the country, <laughs> why not create a system where reliably, again and again, uh, the candidate you want to win will win. So tell us a little bit about what it means to eliminate winner-take-all elections. Sure, yeah. I mean, so for the U.S. House, um, you know, the, the system that we use is called, in, in my field of political science, it's called single-member district plurality. Um, and that means that we have 435 separate elections to the House. Um, the winner is the person with the most votes, even if that's not a majority. It could be a plurality, right? So it's a plurality rule elections. Uh, you know, to make a long story short, the political science here is really clear. Um, the effect of those elections is to reduce the number of, of real political parties that have a chance of winning office. Um, so our two-party system comes mostly, though not entirely, from our from the way that we elect the House of Representatives. Um, so that's all that could all be changed, right? Um, and that system is not in the Constitution. Uh, the other problem with it, in addition to, to I think depriving Americans of the choice of a third party. Um, which the, a majority of Americans say that they want more than two choices at election time. Right? So even if you're a really committed Democratic partisan like me, I recognize um, that, that there are people out there that want to be able to vote for someone else. And I, and I would like to grant them that wish, you know. Um, so the other problem is that often, uh, together with the way that we draw the districts for the House, uh, it makes it possible for parties to win a majority in the House without winning the national popular vote for the House of Representatives. So. Uh, as you know, if you've read Dave Daly's book, um, whose name I can't say on air, but... Uh, I know, I had Dave on yeah. the show a couple times to talk about yeah. it, which was a challenge from a broadcasting point of view. Rat definitely, definitely. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. book. Um, and it really tells the story yeah. of uh, the Republican effort to redraw uh, these House districts after 2010. Together with the way that Democrats increasingly live together in cities and, and, and sort of more urban areas, uh, it means there's a structural disadvantage for Democrats to take back the House of Representatives. Um, a good way of thinking about that uh, is that Democrats won the national vote for the House in 2012, um, but they lost the House of Representatives pretty decisively to the Republicans due to the gerrymandering and due to the sort of partisan clustering. Um, I mean, just imagine uh, how different things might be right now if, if Barack Obama had another two years of unified control in D.C. to make policy. Um, you know, I don't, like, not like, all the problems of the world wouldn't be fixed, but I think it would have been great. Um, and so people think that Democrats need to win the national House vote by like five to 11 points this fall in order to take back the House. And that's just, to me, that's just bananas. Right, um, it is. So again, it's not in the Constitution. Uh, Congress could, could pass a law uh, bringing in something called ranked choice voting. Right. Uh, and that is where you, you, know, you rank order the candidates that you want to vote for. Um, we could have three or five member districts. Um, if, I, if I had my way, I'd actually like to double the size of the House um, and have five or ten member districts. Um, if, under this kind of law, this is how Ireland uh, votes for their parliament. The more, the bigger the, the size of the districts, the more proportional the outcomes, right? So I think it'd actually be much better if, if Congress was enlarged, um, as the framers of the Constitution wanted. Uh, they didn't want any more than a 30,000 to 1 legislator to constituent ratio, and we now have 700,000 to 1, which is the second worst mm -hmm. in the entire world. So. Anyway, there's a lot going on there, and it's um, it's a little bit hard to explain in a five minute bite. But no, no, I understand. Uh, there, there, there is a there's a way to, to change how we vote for the House that would make our outcomes more proportional. That means like if the parties of the left got the most votes, um, then they would almost certainly get the most seats in the House. You know, like there's no voting system that's foolproof, um, but this would eliminate gerrymandering from the face of the earth. Uh, it would it would eliminate the built-in rural 
uh, partisan Republican advantage in the House of Representatives, it would mean that the left wouldn't have to win an election by 11 points to win the election. You know, you could win by one point, as you're supposed to, under democratic theory. Um, and again, just like with uh, D.C. and Puerto Rico and just with the Modern Voting Rights Act, um, there's nothing there's nothing constitutionally stopping us from doing this. Um, and I, I think it's really important to address these structural barriers to progressive power in this country. Uh, I think those those debates are just as important as the policy debates that we have about, you know, single payer or, or the, you know, military policy or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I do encourage people to take a look at your suggestions there. Uh, and but I can't let you go, uh, given the um, <laughs> given the news, the, the burning news that uh, do, there is going to be a new vacancy on the Supreme Court under Donald Trump. The last one, of course, his ability to put the uh, ideological fanatic Neil Gorsuch, my opinion, not yours necessarily, on the Supreme Court because of the cheating uh, that um, Mitch McConnell you know, insisting that you can't, uh, in the final year of a presidency, pick a Supreme Court justice, it was an odd interpretation. He never, by the way, specified exactly what the period of time was that, that, where it remained legitimate for a sitting president to pick a Supreme Court judge, um, because he clearly didn't care about the reasoning. He just wanted what he yeah. wanted. Um, now, uh, now we've got, Trump has the opportunity to pick another. We mentioned Senator uh, Blumenthal saying that it should uh, be judged in a speedy manner. I say stall it, stop it by any means necessary um, and uh, make up a rule. Make up a, a, you know, the rule is if a president doesn't win a majority, he can't pick any more Supreme Court. Not. Just make one up. If the president's sure. initials are DT, you can't pick one. It's just a rule. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but you have other ideas too. In fact, not just in the book, but in uh, a recent piece you published, perhaps presciently last, uh, in May, a couple months ago, uh, how the Democrats could thwart Trump's Supreme Court takeover. So tell us about it. Well, sure. I mean, I think in the, in the short run, there's, there's, uh, there's almost nothing the Democrats can do to thwart this, um, unfortunately, because the Republicans eliminated the filibuster for Supreme Court picks. And, I think the 51 Republicans in the Senate, even the ones that, you know, uh, send, uh, uh, you know, carefully worded tweets at the president occasionally, like Jeff Flake, they're going to vote to put whatever Federalist Society fruitcake that they nominate on the on the on SCOTUS. And, and that'll be that. So but I do think it's important for Democrats to hang together and to and to produce 49 votes against this justice. Um, the thing this is another place where. <laughs> The number of justices on, this, on the Supreme Court is not in the Constitution. Um, in fact, the powers of the Supreme Court more generally are not really in the Constitution at all. Um, so judicial review, where we set aside uh, laws passed by Congress as unconstitutional, you will not find that language in the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's, it's been built by precedent. So the court is in a variety of ways really vulnerable to the destruction of norms on both sides. And so when Republicans stole the swing seat on the Supreme Court in 2016 when they refused to seat Merrick Garland, uh, and then they collaborated with a hostile foreign power to win the 2016 presidential election. Uh, they, they, they finished breaking uh, a process that was already sort of teetering on the edge of collapse. Uh, and that's the sort of bipartisan norm that the president gets to fill a Supreme Court seat when it's open. Right? That's like a baseline value of, of 20th century American politics. And Republicans just threw it in the trash. Um, I don't think anybody believed that there's this, you know, there was this magical election year rule, uh, the McConnell rule, whatever Democrats want to call it now. Everybody knows it was a power play. Um, and so uh, when I think about that, it, it makes my blood boil because there should be, a li there should be for the first time in my whole life, <laughs> a liberal majority on the Supreme Court right now, there's not. Um, and so I think that Democrats need to get serious about this process when they get back into power. Um, and there's, there's two ways to get serious about it. You know, in, in one sense, we need to think about the basic unfairness that's at the heart of this process. Um, and that's not, a, that's not an unfairness produced by Republicans. Uh, it's an unfairness produced by the constitutional process. Um, and that is like Supreme Court openings are a lottery. You know, these, these people are appointed for life. Um, and then we have to wait for them to voluntarily step down or get ill or die. Um, I, I call it the feet first rule, right? So you, gotta, you can get carried out of office feet first. Um, and so Jimmy Carter got zero picks to the Supreme Court. Uh, FDR got zero picks in his first four years. That's why he initially had the plan to pack the courts. Um, Reagan got three, you know, um, and then uh, the last three presidents have gotten two. Trump is going to have two in his first 18 months. Um, and that's just, it's just crazy, right? It's crazy that our, our politics is held hostage 
to what is functionally a completely random process of vacancies opening up. So there's an organization in DC, it's called Fix the Court, um, and they have a plan to, to reform this process. They think they can do it within the confines of the Constitution. I'm not really so sure, um, but it would, it would establish a process where uh, Supreme Court justices serve 18 year terms um, and then they're gone. Uh, so every president would have the right to appoint two justices for every four year term. Um, and this would, I, in my mind, if we could actually achieve this, it would be magical. Um, it would reduce the stakes of these appointments. Uh, there'd be no more, there'd be a lot less sort of uh, shenanigans around these appointments. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, I think it might be unconstitutional and I think a constitutional amendment is, is sort of a non-starter. I think that we should offer a constitutional amendment to Republicans doing exactly that, you know, eliminate lifetime tenure, routinize the process. Actually, I think we could also spell out the Senate's obligations under advice and consent, which is another place that the, the Constitution's uh, super vague in a very unhelpful uh, way that allowed the Republicans to correctly make the argument in 2016 that they weren't obligated to consider Merrick Garland, which is, I think, strictly true, although not, of course, in the spirit of American politics. But then I think if, if the amendment is turned down, then I think that we need to move forward with a court packing plan. Um, and that would add the number of seats on the court that is required to produce the liberal majority that was stolen from us in 2016. Um, and there's nothing in the Constitution stopping us from do that. Um, there's the, the, the number nine doesn't appear in the Constitution. Um, FDR's plan fell apart because of politics, uh, not because it was unconstitutional. And I think that what Republicans did with Merrick Garland really gives us the, the ammunition that we need um, to make the case that this, this hardball maneuver, which I wouldn't have considered uh, two years ago, uh, that, that we have to do this. Um, that the, the future of the Republic really uh, is dependent on, on having a, a liberal Supreme Court, that, that we deserve it, that was stolen from us. Uh, and not just that, but if you, if you go back over the last uh, 30 years, Democrats have gotten 30 million more votes for the US Senate since 1992. Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections. I mean, the people want Democrats filling the federal judiciary. And there's all these little design quirks of the Constitution are, are preventing that from happening right now. So that's where I am. I don't like to call it court packing. I like to call it enhanced court appointment techniques, but um, you know, call it whatever you want. It's, I think it's something we have to do. <clears throat> I, I would call it opening the court, you know, it, yeah. the, the uh, democratizing the court. Yeah, there are all sorts of names. Competitive court competition. We're competing for, yeah. uh, you know, we'll work on that together, but I love the idea. And it sounds like historically for the reasons you described, <clears throat> it's time to take the number nine out of the Supreme Court and put it back where it belongs, which is on the Beatles white album. So uh, <laughs> we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, but I thank you for all of these ideas. I thank you for the constructive ideas about the Supreme Court in particular, because I think too many Democrats right now are thinking unhealthy thoughts about what they might do to the Supreme Court. I think it's better to think positive thoughts about expanding it. So uh, great stuff. I really recommend to folks that they uh, take a look at it. your book, David Ferris. It's a, the book is called It's Time to Fight Dirty, How Democrats Can Build a Lasting Majority in American Politics. And also, thanks for coming on the program. RJ, thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, me too.